Hi everybody, I'm here with another review of a Vampire the Requiem product. This time it's one of my favorite old source books, which my wife got me for Christmas this year. Uh, that is City of the Damned New Orleans. Uh, this was the first city book that was produced for the New World of Darkness. It was one that I was salivating over because I loved the appendix of the Vampire the Requiem uh, core rule book. Uh, the appendix had basically like a, a small bit of the flavor of the New Orleans setting uh, to get you started storytelling within this world. Um, it was pretty tantalizing to me at the time. It was very cool. So uh, this was a book that I was looking forward to a lot when it came out. Uh, unfortunately, it came out right before I went off to college and uh, I had an, a huge dry spell during college uh, where I didn't get to role play. Um, I did, however, get to play one session of Vampire the Requiem in this setting in college, and it was the worst role-playing experience of my life, which I will discuss later. Um, but please do not let that one session reflect poorly on this product. Uh, getting this book, I, I got it because it was one of my favorite books previously. Um, but because I have had this kind of renewed interest in Vampire the Requiem with the Blood and Smoke update, the second edition update, um, I wanted to know, was, I, was this nostalgia talking again? Uh, I, there have been times in my life where I have seen products and when upon a second look, I've been like, what the hell was I thinking? This was garbage. Um, but I was pleasantly surprised when I got this one, because I did think that that was what was going to happen. I tracked down some reviews of this product online, and uh, while some of them, it was basically like a 3 out of 5 the whole time. Uh, some of them were okay, others were like, this is totally boring and bland, and why would anybody ever like this book? And I remember really, really enjoying this setting, and wanting to play in it, and wanting to storytell in it, uh, and never really having the opportunity to do so. Um, and like I said, I was pleasantly surprised. This is an excellent product. Uh, it is a very, very good setting uh, for Vampire the Requiem. On its own, in the context of the first edition of Vampire the Requiem, this was a solid book. Uh, it lays out the history of New Orleans from kind of a kindred perspective, starting back uh, just previous to the Civil War and moving up through the modern day. Uh, talking about the, the kind of movers and shakers that are now the, the prince and the primogen and uh, the different political factions in the city, how they kind of evolved. But most importantly, uh, what I got from this was the wonderful, just this is the perfect setting for Vampire the Requiem. This is what the developers said if there was one location that could be used to kind of encapsulate the feel of Vampire the Requiem, that New Orleans was it. Um, interpreted through the lens of the world of darkness, of course. Um, this book also came out like six months or a year before Hurricane Katrina happened, so I'm going to talk about that as well. Uh, so it's it's very interesting, <laughs> to, very interesting uh, content in this book compared to what happened in reality. Um, one of the things I love about this setting is there's this huge juxtaposition between the different fates that rule this city. And that's not even getting into the kindred aspect of it. Uh, there is a, a very large, devout Catholic population, uh, and there is also a very large uh, population that follows the kind of uh, Haitian uh, hoodoo or voodoo, vodun, whatever you want to call it, um, kind of pantheon of spirits. Uh, so you have these clashing fates, this kind of hardcore old world Christian uh, Catholicism versus this new paganism that has even incorporated some of uh, the Christian figures into their pantheon of, of gods and spirits. Uh, and so you have a lot of conflict there already uh, to choose from. The setting New Orleans also offers an enormous array of diversity for you to make characters for. Uh, it is a very, very uh, cool place. And the the city itself is described as kind of slowly sinking into the swamp. Like the, the very city itself has this kind of vampiric aspect to it. Um, and it's excellent. Uh, the kind of flavor of this book, it's very well written. It still didn't have the kind of 
uh, aggressively active voice that the new edition of uh, Requiem has that I love so, so very much. Um, but on its own, it was a good product, and it uh, provides enormous, an enormous number of plot hooks and story seeds and uh, interesting competing factions to get tangled up in and, and to play this game. Uh, it also includes an introductory adventure uh, called The Dead Travel Fast, which is okay. Uh, that was one of the major criticisms I saw when I was looking for this book again, and those criticisms stand. It's a little bland, it introduces you to all the factions, and it's not something that I would run unmodified. And it's in, in its defense, it's not supposed to be run unmodified. You're supposed to take this as kind of inspiration and a jumping off point for your own uh, stories and ideas. And the other thing is, it's not like their adventure is going to survive contact with your players. Your players are going to do things that you would never expect, and all of this stuff is going to kind of go out the window immediate, immediately anyway, assuming you have fun and interesting players. Uh, so the breakdown of the book, um, it gives you kind of a lay of the land at first. It, it really goes over the feel of New Orleans, um, which is actual, excellent writing. I really loved it. I loved the history that they offered. Uh, the history itself allows uh, for games to be set in the, uh, in the 17 and 1800s uh, as the region develops. And the characters in this game that are now elders, uh, being you know more like Neonates and Ancilla, that would be an awesome setting to play in on its own. Uh, that, that small chapter provides you with uh, an, a ton of inspiration for games. Um, after that, it talks a little bit about kind of the, the actual lay of the land of New Orleans as it is, describes uh, the different sections of the city, whether it's the Garden District, the French Quarter, blah, 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 blah. Uh, various uh, kind of supernatural happenings that, that have occurred in those places, how they tie into the world of the kindred, and um, it's very cool. Uh, the kind of spiritual aspect to this this setting is great. Uh, there's all sorts of hauntings, and it's really it's one of the cities within the world of Vampire the Requiem that uh, has a, a a large vampire population proportionally uh, considered to the human population. Uh, it attracts sinners. It attracts evil. It attracts debauchery and uh, it attracts sin. And that's the thing that this, this book and this setting uh, really, really comes across with, is there is an element of sin to it, um, especially the deeper that you get into uh, the different characters and NPCs. Now, that's something actually to talk about. Um, this is a storyteller resource. This is not a player resource. Um, there's a lot of interesting stuff that you can get out of this as a player, but the point is that the appendix in Vampire the Requiem, the core book uh, for the first edition, that appendix, it, they treat that as this is what is commonly perceived about the characters within that. Um, this is what most of your players, this is the kind of common knowledge that they would have about those characters. This book has the gritty, gory details and the truth uh, about those characters. Um, and there's still ambiguity, there's still things to play with uh, within those. Uh, but some of it, some of the information in this book is contradictory to what you would find in that appendix. And that's a cool thing. So if you're a player looking uh, to know about New Orleans as a setting, really you should be looking at the first edition uh, Requiem Core book and read that. Um, otherwise, you'd be spoiling a lot of really, really cool shit in this book. Uh, on its own, as a first edition product, this is, this is really good. Uh, but again, to me, now that the second edition is out, this is a reminder of kind of a bygone era in terms of Requiem and the World of Darkness. It is a relic of a less interesting past. Um, what I love about this book, though, has been taking my understanding of Blood and Smoke, my understanding of Requiem's second edition, and reading this book through that lens, through the lens of the Vampire the Requiem clan books, which I will be doing an entire series on. I got these things. They are awesome. They are so cool. And I can totally understand that why people thought that this was a those books were a turning point in Requiem as a product. Um, looking at this through a second edition lens is oh, just an absolute blast. Everything is scarier. Everything is darker. And everything is way, way more interesting. 
the whole spiritual aspect of it of this uh the 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 uh vodusants the 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 vo uh, voodoo kind of priests and priestesses whatever you want to call them uh voodoo the hoodoo and voodoo tradition you know is where we get these legends of zombies people coming back from the dead mindless the mindless dead now looking at that in light of the strix uh which i kind of panned in my review of <laughs> blood and smoke this has given me a new perspective on the strix even though there is not a goddamn word about the Strix in this book. The Strix are a perfect supernatural entity to introduce to this setting. It is unbelievably perfect. There are cemeteries everywhere. They're huge. Uh, the, they're, I mean, they're harbingers of doom, which I'll be talking about a little bit in, in a little bit. Uh, this makes the whole zombie legend have a lot more credence, not only with the, the mortal population, but even with the vampires. Uh, having the Strix be an... A, a mysterious force, something, you know, these are the blood-drenched corpses walking around. They're the people possessing corpses, causing them to come back, giving actual credence uh, and, and a legitimacy to the legends of zombies. Um, the uh, Circle of the Crone, uh, a couple of the major characters within the Circle of the Crone, uh, particularly Baron Simithier, who is one of my favorite characters. He's so cool. Uh, he's this, like, uh, he was an he was a slave in Haiti, uh, was embraced in Haiti, and suffered and claims to have suffered final death, but been, uh, but to have been brought back to reality to the uh, the world of the undead uh, by Baron Samedi himself, by this Loa, this this voodoo kind of spirit or god. Uh, Baron Smithier, one of the plans that he has, and many of the other uh, uh, Circle of the Crone characters have involves uh, kind of trying to bind the Loa to themselves or to others. And this whole idea of, uh, of becoming kind of a conduit for these spirits takes on a much, much more sinister note when you consider the Strix, and that the Strix are mysterious to the kindred, and most of, most of them, almost all of them, even the most mystically knowledgeable uh, characters within this game, aren't going to know a hell of a lot about the Strix. Uh, bringing the Strix in in this context makes it so much cooler uh just just so much cooler um and it yeah they it is awesome uh there was a sidebar in this this book is full of plot hooks and and story seeds it's it's really good in that aspect it's something i really really enjoyed about this book um there is a sidebar about the big one the hurricane that comes and wipes out kind of wipes out new orleans and this was written before Hurricane Katrina, and I don't think they ever would have put... I don't even know if they would have chosen New Orleans as a setting um, after, if Hurricane Katrina had happened before they published this. Uh, I think it just would have been way too sensitive of a topic. But now that that's been over for years, and the, the kind of repercussions of it are still being felt in New Orleans in a big, big way, um, it makes for a very interesting, solid end point to a chronicle. Or a very, very solid and interesting jumping off point for a chronicle in New Orleans. And again, bringing the Strix into this, when you have a Parliament of Owls, when the, when the Strix gather in large numbers, which they, they're usually completely solitary predators, but when they gather in numbers, they are harbingers of great disasters. And having Strix characters and antagonists that are manipulating the characters and and just this impending sense of doom building and building and building and ending that with the arrival of this horrific storm that breaks the levees and destroys the city and drowns the kindred and brings their bodies up into the streets during daylight and burns them is incredibly incredibly interesting to me in the blood and smoke core book they mention hurricane katrina it's under the blood sympathy section Blood Sympathy Within Vampire the Requiem is uh, really, it's its so cool. And this was present in first edition. It's awesome. It's this idea that uh, those of, those kindred relatives that you have, like your sire, your children, your, uh, your cousins, the, those who are the closest to you by blood, uh, if something traumatic happens to them, you will, because of your connection to their blood, you will have like visions of uh, of their demise or their doom or these really whatever it, even if it doesn't even have to be a negative experience just a very passionate experience you will get flashes in your mind of this happening uh within the blood and smoke core book 
they address Hurricane Katrina. When that happens, kindred all over the United States started having these visions because they were related to different characters within there, and they start fucking losing their minds. And that that was awesome. And so I would love to to actually try and, and run this setting post Hurricane Katrina when the political landscape when you know the, the slate has almost been wiped totally clean uh, the mortal power bases of, of the elders has been completely dismantled and thrown in disarray and everything's up for grabs that is a cool scenario um, so th this book has actually been enhanced by time um, time has been very very kind to this as a source book uh, and so, like I said, I think it's actually better as a second edition product than it was as a first. First edition was great, but the second edition interpretation of this product makes it even better. Um, and like I said, there's a ton of story hooks in this. And the way that the book is broken down, after you get that lay of the land, you get uh, a chapter called Games of the Elders. And Games of the Elders goes through all of the major elder characters, what their agendas, agendas are, uh, what their relations to one another are, previous alliances that they've had, why they have animosity towards each other now. Uh, it's really great, and it talks about their mortal power bases as well, which is such an important part of this. And there's so many ways in which your characters can get caught up in the schemes of the elders directly. Um, now, after that is a chapter that I think is even better, and uh, that is the chapter on the Ancilla, the kind of uh, middle-aged kindred. Not elders, not neonates. These are my favorite characters, uh, at least in theory, to play, because I don't ever get to play. Uh, but these are my favorite characters always. I love the Ancilla. They're the most interesting, because they have the most to lose. Uh, their, their positions are always super shaky. Um, and they have an enormous amount to gain. Um, and they're not just, you know, fresh out of the morgue. Uh, so to speak. They uh, they are where comfortably I would love to play a game always. Uh, it's somewhat interesting to me sometimes to play an elder. It's very fun for me to run a game with neonate characters, uh, but I would love to play an Ancilla game. Um, and that chapter is called Wheels Within Wheels. And this is, uh, I think, the best characters in the book, the best NPCs, the best agendas, the best kind of stories uh, lie within that chapter. And again, this is another way in which your characters can get sucked up into the into the plots of the elders and any of the other things. Uh, it's great. And then the last uh, chapter in this respect is going to be talking about uh, the neonates, uh, which I think that chapter is called uh, Working the Street. And these are the characters that if you're playing neonates, you're most likely to encounter. Uh, and there's a lot there's a lot to work with there as well uh, after that of course you have the dead travel fast like I said which is kind of a bland adventure that is a fair, totally fair criticism of this book uh, and then you have your storytelling um, section which gives you uh, lots of different themes to choose from for running your chronicle uh, it's pretty pretty standard storytelling advice there's nothing that I found truly amazing in there um, basically just the the different theme options that they that they give you are are very, very, uh, they're, they're good. They're good jumping off points and get you kind of thinking about the story. Um, but overall, this is a fantastic product. This is a, uh, I'm, I am absolutely running a game in this setting. Uh, and it's most likely going to be with my in real life group. Um, and it will be thoroughly second edition of Requiem. But um, if you want, if even if you're play first, still even playing first edition of Vampire the Requiem, you can't go wrong with this book. It's, it's, it's a solid product. The art uh, is, is pretty good. It's standard for, for that edition of the game, uh, pre-Clan book. Uh, uh, one of the things I loved was this cover. I thought it was just so evocative. You have, you know, the uh, the skull with the candle for the kind of the more uh, voodooistic aspect of this, the paganistic thing. But you're also in this this cemetery uh, staring with the, with the dead, doing some probably blood ritual, Kruak ritual, uh, and having you know, this religious icon staring down on you. It's just, it's so evocative. It's so good. Uh, and this is actually a, a mint condition, uh, first edition text, too. This is not a reprint through drive through RPG. Uh, it has the beautiful matte cover that I loved so much about that edition that I miss. <laughs> I miss now that they're doing print on demand with just the glossy world of darkness here. Um, it's, it's great. This is a book that I, I used to have, and I was so disappointed when I had to give it up. Um, 
I won't give it up again. It's 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 excellent. Um, and one more thing, uh, uh, Kruak is a, an ability. It's a it's a blood magic through the Circle of the Crone. Uh, the Circle of the Crone, now that it is way more interesting than it was in first edition, uh, they have a huge presence within the city. Both them and the Lenkei Sanctum are kind of the two main political factions, though the others are all represented there. Um, you and you can make you like bringing the covenants, the new kind of refocused covenants into this setting also just makes it so awesome. Uh, there being less hierarchy to the uh, the circle of the crone makes it better. The fact that Kruak uh, is a power that is coveted and practiced also by the Strix, uh, and be, that being tied into the kind of uh, voodoo and Vodun legends uh, makes the Strix an even more potent tool in your storytelling book, uh, storytelling arsenal. Um, so, if you have Blood and Smoke, or 2nd Edition, uh, now that the actual 2nd Edition uh, text is out, if you have those, you should get this book. It's an excellent resource, especially after you've absorbed and digested 2nd Edition. Um, I've had a blast rereading this, and I cannot wait to put this stuff to use.